Welcome everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our Venture Capital keynote panel, the second virtual panel co-hosted by the Harvard College China Forum and Harvard Undergraduate Capital Partners in 2021. My name is Audrey Schein, and I am the Director of Ventures at the Harvard College China Forum. And my name is Nathan Zhao, and I'm the Vice President of Product for Harvard Undergraduate Capital Partners. Before we begin, we want to share a little bit about our organizations. Harvard College China Forum, HZF, is North America's premier and longest student-run conference for US-China relations. Under normal circumstances, HCCF is the proud host of an annual 100K startup pitch competition sponsored by Primavera and GenFund, connecting investors from China to startups here in the Boston ecosystem. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic, our conference has consisted of two online VC panels, one today and one yesterday, culminating in an in-person conference on April 17th in Beijing. Harvard Undergraduate Capital Partners, or HUCP, was founded five semesters ago because we recognized that university entrepreneurial ecosystems face a connectivity problem. They are very fragmented, so top students and founders oftentimes have difficulty connecting with strong investors. Thus, as a top undergraduate VC club at both Harvard and MIT, we seek to fill that void. We exist to make VC and entrepreneurship accessible to students and founders at great universities. For your information, the panel will also be live streamed on YouTube and Youlo. To submit questions to our panelists, type them directly into the Zoom Q&A icon at the bottom bar of your screen and we'll convey your questions to our moderator. Now, allow me to introduce our moderator for the panel tonight, Professor Xun Yuan Zhang. Professor Zhang is an assistant professor of business administration in the marketing unit at Harvard Business School. Please welcome Professor Zhang. Thank you, Nathan and Audrey, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Well, let me just say it's a real privilege to be here with some of the leading VCs and entrepreneurs in the US and China. And I'm thrilled to be having this conversation uh, with them about investing in the post COVID world. I mean, these are huge topics that we're thinking about and talking about nowadays. And I definitely look forward to the great perspectives that will come out of this panel. And with that, let's welcome our four panelists, Eric Rosen, uh, Rosenblum uh, from Team Yuan Ventures, uh, Tony Chow uh, from Taiki Partners, um, Jason Schumann from Primary Venture Partners, um, and Raj uh, Sandhu from uh, Great Oaks VC. And I will briefly introduce each of them, and then we can get started with our uh, conversation with uh, our speakers. Um, so our first uh, panelist, Eric, Eric, Eric uh, Rosenblum, is a managing partner at Qing Yuan Ventures uh, with a focus on the early stage cross-border inventions in software like science and frontier hard tech. And Eric started his career in China and founded a company called SmartPay, uh, which was one of China's first private payment companies. And our second panelist, Tony Chow is a partner at Taiki Partners with a focus on disruptive technologies in artificial intelligence, virtual realities, semiconductors, and mobile software. And Tony previously managed um, a $250 million portfolio of more than 60 companies at Applied Ventures. And we also have Jason Schumann, from, um, who is a partner at Primary Venture Partners focusing on consumer technology and marketplace and startups. Um, and Jason was previously uh, the chief of staff to uh, Jason German uh, uh, Group's co-founder, Mark Jerson, uh, where he was uh, responsible for all the in venture investments. And lastly, our first panelist, Raj Sandhu, is a partner at Great Oaks VC. And in his two decades investing, Raj has backed over 100 companies across all industries. And Raj also co-founded Modulus Video, which was uh, acquired by Motorola. And he previously worked in private equity and technology banking. Um, so that's a, let's say again, welcome uh, our panelists and thank you for your involvement. And I'm sure as our conversation goes on, we're going to 
digging into some specific topics and issues. But I do want to start off with a more general question. Um, as I just gave a very brief back intro about each of you, I'm sure our audience would love to hear more from you about your work and if you could share uh, what are the driving factor be behind your investment in your focus industries. And Eric, can I call on you to start because you're the first one from left to right on my screen. Oh, well, that's that's very uh, that's very good luck. Uh, first, thanks uh, for for having me. Uh, I graduated Harvard 1992 and MIT in 1997, so the club representing Harvard and MIT together uh, feels like coming home. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, first, just a very brief background because that will help you understand our driving force uh, behind our investments. So Chinyuan Ventures was founded about 10 years ago by a group of graduates from Tsinghua University who had come to the US for their PhDs, founded companies, and then formed this club uh, called Teak Angel Fund, uh, which was investing really in that background of, of, uh, of entrepreneur. So their entrepreneurs often came from China originally or building companies in the US. Um, so the prototypical example of that is Zoom Video. Uh, so Teak Angel Fund was lucky enough to be the seed investor in Zoom Video, uh, and Eric Yuan had famously gone to every venture capital firm in Silicon Valley uh, and was rejected by almost all of them. And so that was very fortunate for Teak Angel Fund, Bill Tai, and some others with China backgrounds to be able to make that investment. Then subsequently, uh, we were the uh, angel investor in five other unicorns, so Plus.ai, WeRide.ai, um, Quantergy, et cetera. And so all of these have something in common, which is they have a very technical founder who was originally from China, who came to the States, got a PhD, then founded the company. So that determines a lot of what we do. Uh, so we're looking for very technical founders who have the ability to operate cross-border is the driving principle. We only invest in the US uh, and we invest normally $1 million in the first institutional round of financing out of a $150 million fund. So that kind of determines everything that, that drives our investment thesis. Thank you, Eric. Um, Tony, if you could also share your perspective, that would be great. Yeah, I'm happy to. I, I feel like I'm in good company. Uh, just like Eric, I'm also MIT undergrad uh, for <laughs> business school. So uh, but it's uh, nice to be among uh, friendly faces. So, uh, you know, you can kind of tell from my educational background, I'm pretty uh, technically oriented. Uh, as you mentioned previously, I ran Applied Materials Venture Arm, and I've been now a VC going on 14 years. And the whole time I focused on technology-centric things, and uh, that's what we do at Taiki as well. So we call ourselves a hard tech firm, which means we focus on high technology companies that have uh, a aspirational vision to disrupt industry, uh, really radically change the world. And our view is that these fundamental breakthroughs in technology have multiple ways of innovation and a lot more to offer the economy in the long run rather than, uh, you know, rather than things that are, you know, no, uh, no disrespect intended, but a social media app or a, a game tends to have a sh shorter life cycle in terms of following innovation. So we're really looking for these things that are foundational and uh, uh, much longer range in their impact. Um, and because we're entrepreneurial and technologists by background, we really roll up our sleeves and uh, work with our companies hands-on to uh, you know, solve their operational problems, uh, go to market strategies, uh, act kind of like an entrepreneur. And you know, sometimes I call it myself a schizophrenic entrepreneur because I feel like I get to play different uh, startup roles, founder roles uh, simultaneously. So that's really fun. Uh, yeah, so uh, Taiki uh, is based in the Bay Area. We're about six years old, uh, currently investing in our fund too. Fortunately, we've had a number of uh, successes already, a lot of them in the Boston area, uh, around the Harvard MIT circles. Desktop Metal recently went public. Form Labs is also out that way. Uh, and one of our uh, most recent ones also uh, a Harvard founder. So really excited about the ecosystem in Boston. Um, 
Yeah, so typically we're enter investments in the Series A to Series C ranges. You know, check size is range, range between one to 10 million, usually somewhere in the three to five range. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to the discussion and uh, hopefully working with all of you in the near future. Thank you, Tony. Jason, can we also hear from you? Yeah, and first of all, thank you guys for having me. Um, so I work over at Primary Venture Partners, as you had mentioned. Uh, the firm was founded back in 2015 by two co-founders, uh, Ben Sun and Brad Sferluga. And back in 2015, New York City wasn't the, uh, the tech ecosystem that it is today. Uh, and having been founders prior, the two of them looked at the, the ecosystem and, and said to themselves, you know, startups are hard, especially at the beginning stages, and founders deserve better. So if we're going to really push founders to focus, so should we be. So. Uh, as a firm, we're, we're as focused as it gets. We're New York only, we're pre-seed seed only. We only lead or co-lead. We do three to four deals per partner per year. Uh, and then our model is very similar to Andreessen Horowitz or an Insight Partners where we have 11 folks on our portfolio impact team that were C-level executives at a variety of companies like Sail Through and Enigma, Capsule, et cetera. Uh, and those folks go in typically as consultants between seed and series A to help them kind of go through that graduation. And uh, Fund One had 90% graduation rate between seed and A, uh, and we've had some good successes, including Coupang, uh, which just went public uh, recently. Uh, and then myself, I, I grew up outside of Boston in a family of entrepreneurs. And uh, the reason I, I absolutely am passionate about consumer investing has a lot to do with my childhood, I, I, I grew up uh, relatively sick and having to overcome a bunch of adversity. And at the end of the day, I'm, I'm all about uh, empowering other people to live more successful, fulfilling lives. And I believe in democratizing access to powerful tools that you know only a few folks out there have been able to have access to over the years. And ideally, that's what we'll see in the next generation of consumer startups. Thank you, Jason. And I think I'm just hearing from you're about seeing uh, New York being one of the hub and Tony said Boston. And I'm curious what Raj would say to this because I know he is leading one, one of the most active VC, um, a seed VC in New York. So Raj, take it away. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, including us. Uh, yeah, Great Oaks, uh, we have a pretty broad, I mean, we, we uh, of course invest in software and machine learning and, and uh, a lot of tech, deep technology-based companies, but we've also had a pretty broad focus, uh, including uh, taking, uh, having a lot of initial success in consumer, uh, almost B2C and B2B, uh, uh, consumer direct companies. So we had, we, it, the firm was initially started by a gentleman named Andy Bozart, and uh, he, uh, we, we basically decided to focus on um, STEM founders from, from great schools. And uh, so we had a lot of success with people from Stanford. Uh, when, when we invested in a company called StubHub, we invested in a company called Trulia. We had some great success there. And uh, we, you know, we're, we're, the nice thing about our capital is it's pretty, uh, uh, pretty patient. And because we, uh, uh, of course, we, we invest somewhat thematically, but we also amazingly, you know, every once in a while, we'll just love a founder. And so we're very focused on founders and we're very focused on market sizes. So oftentimes we'll just write a check into something that, uh, you know, may not be appealing to a typical VC firm. Like we invest in a, a shoe brand of all things called Allbirds, which, you know, uh, went on to become one of our phenomenally successful companies just with a, a, a you know, relatively small check. Uh, you know, that's not to say that we're totally take flyers on stuff like that. We do, we do think about uh, trends. Uh, about eight years ago uh, at uh, a YC company, I came across that a Boston MIT based team called, uh, that was a starting company called Ginkgo Bioworks. Uh, and I just was uh, familiar with the public company that it doing flavors and fragrances. And I thought, wow, this would be amazing for uh, a company like this that could do yeast-based manufacturing. So it's completely nothing to do with technology. And certainly at biotech, I have no experience, but in this case, I just thought this was an industry that could be seriously transitioned. Uh, so that was eight years ago. And on Friday, you know, there was some kind of possible SPAC transition uh, transaction announcement for about $20 billion. So it's just, you know, things are, I just go to, I just go to point these kinds of things out because of our capital base and because of the way our partners work you know, we're often really, really looking for 
the sort of hardcore science, the hardcore entrepreneurs and the hardcore uh, passion that comes from it. And if there's a big market that's ready to get disrupted in some ways, you know, we'll write, we'll write a, a $250,000 check just to stay involved and, and be early. And then uh, our goal is to basically get a lot of option value from these uh, entry level uh, uh, investments. And then if we like it, we follow them to the series A and the series B, and that's when we basically, you know, uh, double down or triple down. But uh, we see a lot of our, we're, we're primarily like a lot of firms here, seed and pre-seed. And we really think, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to, as the old saying goes, it's, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. And so it's always important to sort of have a little bit of flexibility in the investment process. And so that's what we're all about. Thank you, Raj, and thank all of you sharing your great perspectives. And I think, um, so I'm trying to unpack here a little bit because you, you're hitting on different topics, but one of the, the common points I'm hearing is that you, you all talked about like how things have evolved over time and initially uh, what was going on. And then, uh, for example, Raj, you mentioned about like eight years trend and there was a transition to tech. And also, Tony, you, you talked about disruption. Um, so, so in terms of how things are changing with this dynamics, this trends, I, I, so I just want to like to build on your comments and to ask a follow up question. Um, I mean, if you think about these drive factors where your investing theories, how that have been shifting uh, in the past. And then if we look back a year, like in the past year, how do we see that? What's your uh, perspective about how the COVID-19 um, has changed your evaluation on say the innovation or investment in your focus industries and are we seeing some specific trends um, with regard to COVID-19? What do you think? Um, maybe Raj, I'll, I'll, I'll do a reverse sure. order. Sure, thank you, thank you. No, I mean look, uh, clearly there'll be, um, you know, as people decide that in the United States people are just really literally dying to get back get out there, take vacations, enjoy. So, you know, there'll obviously be a lower uh, uh, interaction with, let's say, streaming video or ordering food to the house and stuff, things like that. But most certainly, uh, you know, the, especially in the areas of software that's powering enterprise backbones and systems and, and uh, you know, C CEOs and CIOs, and even at the board level, people have, you know, the last year has been a massive wake up call. The everybody has to have contingency plans. Everybody has to have a software workflow in place. Everybody has to be able to have document signatures in place. And so there's many, many things that will continue to just uh, be now embedded in the new workflow. You know, I mean, it was like Satya Nadella himself, you know, CEO of Microsoft said, right? We've seen uh, uh, almost an order of magnitude change uh, in, in just a few months. And I think a lot of that stuff is going to stick. Um, clearly we've seen the value of software. Clearly we've seen the value of cloud. Clearly we've seen, you know, that, that, uh, uh, you know, interactions have speeded up. And so we see that in our business, we see that in the venture business and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that later too. But yeah, I think, I think certainly many things will stick around. Many things will stick around and especially those things that have to do with, uh, uh, enterprises and payments and things like that. Thank you, Raj. And um, Eric and uh, Tony, I would like to get your reaction because I think Raj just mentioned that um, some of the values say the values of cloud, the values of software and streaming, these will stay. And Tony, I know you have expertise in virtual reality, AI and disruptive technologies. And Eric, you focus on hard tech uh, software. So I like to get your reflection on this. Maybe Eric, you can get started. Yeah, I'm happy, happy to start. Uh, so I'm a little bit of a contrarian in terms of long-term COVID impacts. Um, I think when you talk to any VC, uh, by the way, in the last year, when the year started, everyone was telling their portfolio companies to prepare for a long winter and cut back, cut your burn. Um, who knows when funding will open again? Uh, and you know the, the rule of thumb was to move to 18 to 24 months of capital. Um, so people were digging in for, for a long time. Uh, now, knock on wood, wherever you are, but 
a lot of the most dire predictions did not really come to pass. And in fact, if you talk to almost any VC, they will tell you that deal flow has been off the charts, that funding rounds have gotten really frothy. Um, so the one thing, just as a VC, you start to learn that the amount of time it took for people to come to your office and, you know, in our case, Los Altos or Palo Alto, um, and just the friction of like getting coffee and walking around and doing those things, that now that everyone's just doing remote meetings, the productivity has gone up significantly. So I do think of that sort of thing. Uh, once you have that level of productivity, it is hard to go back. Uh, and so I do think that the acceptance of remote meetings, uh, a lot of VCs, for example, said they will not invest in anyone outside of the Bay Area or outside of some radius of their office, which I always thought was a bit silly. Uh, but their, you know, their thought was they really want to look you in the eyes and get to know you. And, and, and that there's value in that. But I think the trade-off in terms of the efficiency and reach is going to be hard to go back. There are some, some businesses that will be changed forever. So telehealth went from, I, I'm just going to make up two numbers, but in some cases went up from 5% you know, penetration to 40% penetration overnight. And those are also things that are going to be hard to roll back when you have the convenience of getting a doctor um, you know, through a telehealth portal immediately. Um, that, that's not coming back. However, um, I do think there's been a lot of enthusiasm about you know, quote unquote future of work that may be a bit misplaced. Um, in terms of the technology investments, et cetera. So my personal belief is that the post-COVID investing environment will look a lot like the pre-COVID investing market, except that perhaps a lot more acceptance of remote teams uh, and remote meetings. And frankly, it's just selfish that the VCs realize that they get a lot more done and they see a lot more deals. And so they're willing to forgo some of that touch and feel uh, in exchange for that. Uh, so uh, I don't see it being that dramatic. Uh, I may be wrong. Well, Eric, I mean, that's a great remark. I know you're a VC from Invested uh, in Zoom. So that, so that's also <laughs> yeah, we, a great we, connection. By the way, we, in terms of we, we did a count in our portfolio. So we currently have like 80 um, active companies in the portfolio uh, and tag them by headwinds versus tailwinds. We've had three companies with significant COVID headwinds, meaning COVID hurt them significantly. We've had about 15 companies that had significant COVID tailwinds, either because it was you know, Zoom or Otter. Um, so we're also investors in Otter, which is you know, you're, you're currently streaming this on Otter, I think. Um, and uh, we have other companies that are doing telehealth and digital health, et cetera. And so the ratio of tailwinds to headwinds was you know, like five to one, it was significant. Thank you, Eric. That's great. And Tony, if you could also share your perspective. And also, I, I, I'm also wondering, like I know in, in the, like uh, Eric mentioned, uh, his belief is that post-COVID is gonna be similar to pre-COVID with more virtual meetings and virtual communications. Um, do you also see the similar trend in other, like not just in, in, in the context of meeting, but maybe in, in other trends? Um, happy to, to hear from you, Tony. Yeah, a lot of what Eric says I do agree with, but uh, do agree with, but maybe a slightly different perspective on some of those. Um, so first, it is kind of a tale of two cities. There's the companies that are doing really well because of the COVID tailwinds, and um, we didn't have. To, I don't think we really had any that had headwinds, but plenty that pitched us. Where you know, in the COVID environment, the model didn't make sense or you, you'd want a significant delay involvement just because you don't know how long this period will last, you know, uh, in-person shopping ones or um, or anything related to the travel industry was kind of automatically unpaused for that period. Um, but anything associated with virtual uh, telepresence, uh, re remote conferencing, uh, cloud infrastructure, we have a pretty heavy data and cloud infrastructure exposure. All of those had significant tailwinds. Um, as far as, I, I do think things will go back to pre-COVID uh, timeframe. Unlike Eric, we haven't made any commitments where we just haven't met the entrepreneur, the team face-to-face. -face. So the initial meeting certainly is a lot easier now that everything's remote. We can have uh, several rounds of follow-ons with those uh, companies. And uh, it wasn't explicit, but it just happens that most of the ones we, most of the new checks we wrote, uh, the three or four companies this last year were all Bay Area or um, California, um, where it's possible to drive and meet up. Uh, and the one Boston-based one, we have 
we made all those visits before all the shutdowns happened. So if this had dragged out uh, to you know two years or something like that, I think we'd figure out how to get comfortable without having to meet face to face. But given that travel is resuming, there's just just something about getting to know the the counterparty, uh, making sure the the personality chemistries match before you really you know get into this pseudo marriage with through an investment. Um, yeah, um, but you know you ha you have to be a lot more deliberate. Um, it's almost like dating long distance. You you can have instead of just one weekly partner meeting, we now have two. The second one is just we can't run into each other in the office and chat about something um, that's not not important enough to schedule an explicit meeting around. But without those uh, random touch points, it just gets a lot harder to get stuff done. So. Um, yeah, uh, you know, as things start to open up, I think more more business will be back to usual, and uh, uh, yeah, definitely the, the initial meetings will be much easier because uh, we have the faster reach and no travel commute involved to have those initial meetings. Thank you, Tony. And I just want to uh, pick. I mean, you you shared a lot of uh, great comments, and and just want to pick one of them. And to, to stay on it and explore it a little bit with maybe with Jason, because I th think you mentioned that shopping is also different. And Jason, I know you lead investing in um, consumer tech in the market um, in the marketplace. So I'm curious, what's your uh, reaction to whether you believe what we've been seeing in the past, maybe uh, 10, 15 years, consumer behavior shopping has been different, has been shifting. Do you think there will be any specific changes uh, uh, due to COVID-19? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think, uh, you know, as Raj and I probably look back over the last five to 10 years in, in New York City specific, you know, venture land, consumer world had this like massive climb in the regards to direct to consumer brands. I mean, Warby Parker and Glossier and Harry's are all based here. And it seemed like every week we were getting sent, you know, five to 10 D to C brands. Um, I actually think that the funding curve now has kind of started to go down pretty hard on that. Uh, and it has more to do with the fact that the venture returns just haven't been there for a lot of the, the large D2C brands. You know, uh, the guys at Great Oaks have done really well with that, I think, with, with Allbirds and, and a few others. So there certainly are exceptions to the rule, but a lot of venture firms have started to pull out of that. And in regards to like COVID-19 specifically, I think a few things have happened. One, um, all of us have been drooling because, you know, we were looking at uh, market sizes before and we had to make a lot of assumptions over how fast things would be growing. You know, digital health, as Eric mentioned, I think it was something like 15 percent of American consumers pre-COVID had actually even tried telemedicine. Now that number is exceeding 40 percent. And when you look at different places like care deserts, you know, it really only makes sense for those people to be tapping into resources like that. In terms of like consumer shopping uh, behaviors as well, subscriptions are becoming, you know, extremely relevant in the, in the lives of Americans. Uh, and I think what's really nice about that, and, you know, to go back to the comment on, on D2C before, you know, a lot of those companies were one-off purchases or had 20%, 30% maybe repeat rates. Now you have a monthly subscription with 12 month retention at 35% plus. And when you look at public markets, you see how SaaS companies are doing. There's two reasons why public market investors like it. One, sticky recurring revenue, and two, it's high margin. Now we're finding, you know, D2C brands, subscription companies, and digital subscri subscription companies with very similar characteristics that are starting to take off. And that's only becoming more and more prevalent now because of COVID, I think. Thank you, Jason. And I just got a question from the audience. It's not about COVID per se. But I do like to fit this question in because it's really related to one of the things that you all touched on, that's uh, technologies during the past years. So this question is on the topic of technical founders, to what extent do you look for a match where you can add value in terms of the technology? Or is it OK if you don't have ex experts or deep, deep knowledge of the technology? Um, and Tony, maybe I can. Oh, Raj, feel free to go ahead. <laughs> you, you're muted, Raj. Thank you. I was trying to, uh, sorry about that. I was trying to keep the uh, background noise down. Yeah, look, I mean, that's a very good question. 
and you know, uh, is that there's the Dunning Kruger effect, right? Which is basically a little bit of knowledge is dangerous, and you think like you're going to get, you know, all of a sudden you hear this great idea, and you're like, oh my God, it's going to change the world. So yeah, you know, oftentimes, certainly out in the valley. I've invested my fair share of turkeys, you know, uh, this great thing's going to work out well, it's going to be, you know, a storage or whatever. But I think, you know, it's still, it's, at the end of the day, I think you, if you come across great technical founders, and uh, you have some knowledge of the space, uh, you can do a little checking around to see if the idea makes sense. And you can also just kind of get a sense for, uh, you know, is it, the, the thing that I look for with with technical are they going after a market where is, with, which is largely commodities like for example storage or uh, you know solar and then in which case you just pass but if there's a an opportunity where there's margin in there then I'm then I you know like I'm interested like I for example I gave you an, of the example of uh, Ginkgo Bioworks I was like I knew nothing about it absolutely nothing but I was just fascinated by this collection of absolutely brilliant MIT people that just thought they could, you know, go out and disrupt the space. So yes, uh, definitely encourage people with technical backgrounds to approach VCs. Uh, obviously it's good to have a rounded team. So some technical, or maybe some with selling skills. And at the end of the day, you have to build a solution, you know? So there's a lot of folks that build products and hope the market will show up. It's good to have a solution in mind. So that's the only thing I would say, technology plus a solution focus. Yeah, uh, let me just add a couple of things to that. I think Raj made some great points. Uh, it, the question was, do you need a match? And I think you absolutely need a match in terms of what the investors have exposure and experience in and what the team is working on. Uh, if nothing else, you as the founder, the founding team want value added investors. And if the investors have no clue what your technology or industry is, there's not a lot they can offer and it's just money. And that's generally a dangerous position to be in. Um, and there's the, um, you know, the selection bias, uh, you know, if uh, I don't have a strong life science background, if a life science company comes to me, there are plenty of great life science background VCs out there. There's something wrong when, uh, when I'm the VC that they think is the best match when uh, all these others haven't pulled the trigger. So, um, you know, it, it definitely you've got to find, uh, select your audience carefully. Um, now, on the other hand, there's always these new technologies where there just isn't a lot of expertise out there. Uh, you know, in the earlier days of quantum, you know, it could be one of those where you want generally technology savvy investors who can see the vision and just bet that this is likely to be viable. In those cases, it's okay where you're creating something new. You can't find an existing expert and um, that's perfectly fine. Um, but if it's some sort of well-established field, you, you really need to find VCs that have that exposure. Yeah, we just, uh, you know, again, I'll add a little bit. Um, self, from a self-interest point of view, we chose technical founders because my partners are all technical and they feel they have a relative advantage. And so it's not the case that only technical founders build great businesses. In fact, many of the best businesses have non-technical founders. Um, but the core of the question, I think, is how well does the VC have to understand the technology to pull the trigger? We, you know, for better or worse, um, we have 17 partners and venture partners, 16 are PhDs. I'm the only non-technical person. And so we, we do tend to go fairly deep. And I don't necessarily think it's always the best, but it is the way we work. We like to really understand things uh, because that is how we think we can add value and find others in the network uh, to start to build up you know, everything from their team uh, to business development, understand what milestones they need to hit. Um, also from a self-interested point of view, uh, it so happens that this group of people we're targeting, which are often um, Chinese you know, PhDs from China in the US, when they get very technical, often these ideas are able to flow between China and the US. So if you're inventing a battery technology, there's very little barrier to having the same battery chemistry be in use in multiple places versus trying to do a social media site, which may not fly between different countries, where there's a big cultural dimension. So, you know, just two parts to this answer. So first, um, you know, not all VCs require any real technology. We happen to because of our background and because of what we're looking for. And then second, not all VCs will require a level of technical expertise 
uh, they may just like the business and trust that the founders you know, know more than they do, which is okay. We happen to really want to find someone on our team or within our portfolio that's quite close to the technology. Um, so different VCs have different investment styles. Well, Eric, if I can stay with you for just a, a, a few more minutes, I think what you're saying, um, hitting on here is really interesting because you again mentioned the background of how this company, um, how this VC firm, uh, Qingyuan Venture, was founded at the first place. And as you said, it was a, a, at the beginning, it was a PhD students were from China and they came to the US. And you also said there's a, you know, a little friction and there's a flow between the US and China. Um, and I understand that you drive investment in cross-border. This is really cross-border tech enabled innovations, right? And you were also instrumental um, in the early days of China's payments ecosystem. So I wanna just uh, now talk, uh, have your uh, perspe perspective about uh, the innovation um, in China and in the US, whether, can you please speak to how innovation um, compares to in China compares to innovation in the US or do you see any like difference between the VC landscape in, in, in both countries? Yeah. So, so first, just a, a quick note. I'm not really an expert in the Chinese VC ecosystem, even though we work with, with them. I, I lived there and worked there for 14 years. But you know, the, the person I consider the expert, and everyone should read his book, is Li Kai-Fu, um, Kai-Fu Li. Uh, he was my colleague at Google and wrote a, a book called AI Superpowers, which I think is great. It goes into exactly this question. So I'm going to quote a few things from him. So China is amazing at application. So the scale of AI application in particular is off the charts. And so Kaifu makes the point that true breakthroughs in AI are extremely rare. And in fact, there's only a few people that have made something that you would consider a fundamental breakthrough, so people like Jeffrey Hinton or Yen LeCun. But these happen only every few decades. And then everything else is application of these, of these basic ideas and breakthroughs. And in China, the pace of application is faster and the scale is greater across almost anything, but you know, he talks about payments, self-driving, um, uh, deliveries, uh, micro-mobility, almost across the board. If you, if you can think of an AI application, the scale and speed has been faster in China. And so there's, there's you know, the, the classic venture that we look at uses China to reference for scale and speed, but uses the US as a primary market and they go back and forth and you can often do that. The second thing is that Chinese VC are less daunted by what I would call uh, truly deep tech. So things like, um, you know, innovations uh, in uh, chemistry, uh, so I mentioned batteries, is a focus area of ours. And often we find when we get to series B that the VCs that are willing to write the big checks are actually based in China, much more eager than the US. Um, so when it comes time to come not only out of the lab, and not only you know, do small scale, but now you're looking for large scale, so you're raising large amounts of money. Um, the VC ecosystem there has much more appetite for things that have a lot of technology differentiation. And my belief isn't because they're more technical, it's that there's more industry there, there's more factories, there's more logistics, there's more. And so a lot of times these innovations in truly technical ventures may have more direct application locally. Uh, and so anyway, so those are the two differences I would say is scale and speed of AI and then uh, kind of interest in things that have real R&D components. Thank you, Eric. Um, can we also direct this question to the, the rest of the three panelists and get your reaction? Or, or maybe um, you can speak to the question of uh, what, we can, what needs to be done uh, to bridge the innovation efforts across the, across the two countries, or maybe um, put in a more broader context what about globalization? Like in the past year, uh, we've seen some across border collaboration, collaborations um, in um, not, not just in VC, but also in technology, in innovation, um, in vaccine uh, developments. So can you also speak to that? Um, maybe Jason, can I get you speak first? Yeah, for sure. Um... You know, I, I think one of the things that's been interesting to watch over the last five, you know, 10 years since I got into venture has been the speed at which originally, you know, not originally still today that that Chinese entrepreneurs move. 
Um, you know, there's been so many consumer companies that have spun up in the United States and then a very similar type of company, you know, popped up over in China and sprinted out to at just incredible scale and speed. You know, you look at a company like Musical.ly when it was here in the U.S. and now TikTok, uh, you know, and, and ByteDance over in China. It's just going back to Eric's point, like you have 300 million people in China and the middle class there. It just blows away the numbers uh, here in the American consumer ecosystem. With that said, I think I think you know back then it was there was a lot of consumer things that started here that were popping up there. Now it seems like the things that are starting there are now coming back over here, where it's like you know companies like VIP Kid, um, or you know which is in the the education space, are you know starting to have more and more copycats in the United States that are popping up. So I, I'm not sure exactly from a bridging of the of, of the you know the communities. I think cross border commerce is pretty fascinating, but also getting the entrepreneurs to trade notes more and like really creating community. Uh, so they're able to, to figure out where they could avoid certain pitfalls in similar business models when the markets have similarities, I think would be great. But uh, you know, when you look at a company like Pin Dua Dua, that model wouldn't necessarily be able to come to the United States because of the nuances in the market. And I think that that's also an important piece that uh, a lot of American entrepreneurs need to be careful about. Thank you, Jason. And, and Rush, if I may, I like I actually like to uh, uh, get your reaction on somewhat a, a little bit different question because this is what I just uh, heard from Jason about you know you identify at the early stage what are the pitfalls um, and whether there are some things that um, the entrepreneurs can can do to address the issues. So I, I know you you all, you mentioned that um, you were like a is seeding a VC um, and you were very patient uh, about investment. So I'm wondering whether you identify any early signals about success or pitfalls that we can potentially see. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there's the old trope of hot product market fit, obviously, but, uh, you know, we, 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 we can oftentimes write a small check and, you know, and just see how they're working out. And sometimes we're the, like the, the, you know, first half a dozen checks. Uh, and a lot of the, a lot of the entrepreneurs are young and they're just still trying to figure out the idea. The ideas are young, but I think um, it's amazing what can actually just take off after a little while. Uh, and so, it, you know, at the end of the day, you're looking for, tenacity, flexibility, and, you know, so, uh, you know, and the ability to just sort of gel uh, to a product that actually, you know, lifts off. I mean, I see the universe of the, well, the way we invest at Great Oaks, I see sort of like two broad universes. One is sort of more established markets where the, the needs are clearly, you know, uh, if you're selling enterprise B2B software, and I'm a, I've got a software background and I've, I've done software, enterprise software uh, startups. So I look, in that case, I look much more for experience, people, somebody's actually cracked the code in enterprise before or security or, you know, uh, software-defined networking or building a new data center stack or whatever it is. But it, when you're looking at, 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 uh, at somebody, at, at a team that's coming out of college, uh, dropped out of Stanford or dropped out of computer science and, you know, master's program, and they've got this idea uh, that they want to do something you know, that's completely different. And you're like, okay, um, here's a little bit of uh, capital to go uh, and try it for a little bit. I mean, so that's kind of our, because our, we know that these kinds of moments can uh, either fail small or succeed big. So that's our model, you know, fail small, succeed big. So we're willing to basically do that. So we're, we're, we're looking for the passion in the entrepreneur. We're looking at the passion of the team and we're looking for people that even if their initial idea fails, they can quickly get their act together and move on to the next one. Thank you, Raj. Tony, can I direct a question to you? And, and similarly, um, in terms of your founder journey, if, if you can, if there are any certain advice you'd offer to the, <coughs> uh, you know, to the, um, in terms of, I think Raj mentioned uh, product market fit and what's your advice about uh, product or go to market or, or revenue for the prospective or uh, current founders in our audience? Hey, um, do something you're passionate about uh, where you have deep understanding and deep uh, insight, right? 
don't just follow the herd, be contrarian. Um, you know, if everyone's making a, a social media app, don't make another one um, unless you've got some truly unique insight on uh, what's gonna make a difference. Um, I think passion goes a long way. There's ups and downs uh, you're gonna suffer as a early stage entrepreneur. And unless you're passionate about it, it's gonna really burn you out and just um, lead you down a bad place. So um, what else? Uh, you know, have a, a team of uh, advisors that can give you that honest feedback on how to grow. Uh, you're gonna need to Higher, you're gonna to need to make strategic decisions. And it's always a lonely place when you're the, well, sometimes a sole founder, but at, you know, at, as a founder, as a CEO, you, it's it's all, often lonely up there because you're second guessing yourself on the decisions and having people who've done this in the past that you can go to as advisors uh, will really, really help. Um, that's kind of all I can think of, but happy to. Chat if I can add to if I can add to some of the stuff that Tony said, um, to, you know, a, a, a lot of our audience obviously we're trying to you know um, get young young students out of Harvard to basically take the leap, and I would say don't get discouraged. You know, there's lots of resources out there. You know, you could read up on Y Combinator Startup School. It's a great website to go, and just there's lots of you know great essays there. I would also say that in our experience, single founder companies have oftentimes had a hard time lifting up. It's a, definitely a very, very, very tough journey. Try to find people that you really sync up with and have at least two or three people with somewhat complementary skills. I mean, in the technical area, I, I, we don't mind if we see a little bit, a little extra heavy, uh, uh, you know, a couple founders that are more technical and one that's more sales oriented, one's more marketing oriented, and one that's, but it's a hard journey. It's, you know, make sure you find partners that you really gel with, because uh, just a single partner oftentimes is very rare to be successful. I don't want to be discouraging, but I think, I think multiple founder companies, it's just better for your own sanity. Yeah, I just want to add to Raj as well. I actually started my first company while I was in college as an undergrad, and it was it was a direct to consumer footwear company back in 2011. It was not Allbirds though, but uh, <laughs> I I, uh, I I think the one piece of advice that I wish I got aside from the passion piece that that Tony had mentioned was really like how to to structure your mind and like your thesis at the end of the day. So, you know, when Raj and I and, and any of these guys are investing in an early stage company, we're saying like, yeah, we want them to go find product market fit, but like, that's such a like magical high level sure. thing, you know? So what we tend to push entrepreneurs to do is to create like a sub thesis and go out there and tactically try to prove one thing with the $500,000 or the million dollars. And then once you've proven that thing, you've now earned the right to go raise the next round to prove another one or two things. And that just continues again and again and again until eventually maybe you start to, you get to go public. Um, but I think the important piece there is that you're oftentimes gonna have an experiment that goes wrong and you're gonna be wrong with that subthesis. So then you need to figure out how you're gonna go figure out and learn how to get to that next point. So it's just all about like, speed of learning and iteration and be very clear about your thinking on what it is that you want to prove. Just adding on to Jason's point, you know, find that thing that makes the biggest difference in terms of your business model or your uh, thesis, as opposed to what's the most reachable and easiest to uh, obtain, you know, uh, rather than build that piece of software, or build that factory, because that's something within your technical domain go seek customer feedback, try to sell the product before you've actually built it. Cause that makes much more difference in terms of whether the long-term the business is viable or not than whether you can build it. These are, these are great advice. And I'm just putting myself in the shoes of a founder and Jason specific on your point about um, tech, uh, technically what would you do? Um, I mean, in terms of I, the mindset and uh, being passionate about what I'm doing, that's all great. But, what about the tactics? And Eric, I haven't heard from you. Particularly, I know previously you mentioned post-COVID is going to be more virtual, uh, remote meetings. And in terms of a virtual communication, do you think there are certain things that will be more prominent or what's your advice for the founders to best present themselves in the virtual world? 
Yeah, it, it's a good question. I, I do want to take one uh, step back that may seem a little random, but uh, a lot of the discussion is around you know how to become a better entrepreneur, and I think that the, I think the first thing, the first advice I normally give to the people I think are on this video, which are a lot of students, is get a job at a good company first. You know, if you don't have a great idea, like if you haven't already been working on something that the world really needs, then a question I usually ask people is, how did you learn what good looks like? Because for me, I, I was very lucky. I learned what good looks like at Google. And I also was fortunately you know, at BCG. And then when I look back at my own first company, I did so many things wrong. And I kind of wish I did things in a different order. And so for a lot of people, like, you know, learn what good looks like. And not only that, you'll work with good people and those will become your co-founders. And so that's, you know, the easiest thing by far is you already know what good looks like and you have good people who think you're good and then you do it together. Uh, so to me, that sets you up for so much more success. But getting to, you know, how do you present to this new world? Um, you know, honestly, uh, a lot of stuff is, is similar to uh, the, the organizing of this, of this conference. So there's a lot of people at Harvard and MIT that have joined Harvard University, undergraduate capital partners, for example, or the VC club. And so they are helping to source deals and evaluate deals. And so as part of that, it's much easier to source a deal or to meet someone than it is to come up with a killer idea yourself. There's many more people out there doing things. And so the first thing is just become known uh, within the VC community as someone who understands what to look for, how to evaluate things and start to make those connections. The VC business is a really networked and connected business. And so having more and more opportunities to get to know people that ultimately write checks is extremely useful. And so when it comes down to presenting, you already know enough people that trust you and trust your judgment if you're actually going to start your own company. And that's much easier than the next step, which, which I think was the thrust of your question. Like, you know, do you cold call? Do you do video presentation? That's the hardest thing. Um, if you're in a position where you simply don't know how to get yourself in front of someone, uh, there's a lot of resources out there that tell you, you know, some of the things you might want to try. I think that if you really are, um, you know, cold calling, then I think that it's really important to be part of a community. So I think that's something that YC does extremely well, or plug and play does extremely well, or Alchemist, that you get to be part of an accelerator that has a community of people that start to build some validation, advisorship, and trust, so that when people come, uh, they're part of a larger, you know, demo environment, and they're open-minded about investment versus lots and lots of cold call emails. Um, but my, my advice to take a step back from that is don't put yourself in that position where you have to do that. Uh, it's good to start to build those connections pretty early so that you have trusted advisors out there in the world that you can call upon early. Thank you. And I, there are actually a lot more questions that I would, I would like to ask, but in light of time, I really want to make sure that I get this question out. And Eric, you said we've been talking a, a lot about entrepreneurs and founders. And let me switch the gear a little bit to the other side of VC. So as a leading VCs, um, to, there are students in our audience. Um, what, what would you say to them? I mean, in terms of how can students with interest in VC best prepare themselves, set themselves up for, su for success in the field? Um, feel free to chime in, and anyone. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'll, I'll start a little bit, uh, and I agree with, I agree with Eric's uh, comments for sure. I think clearly the folks that have been involved in setting this up, uh, you know, have shown remarkable uh, entrepreneurial skills and, and honestly, organizational skills, and communication skills and diligence and, in, in you know, as much as VC is, a, a, you know, we, you notice that and, and, and networking is a big deal. But you know, VC is as much art uh, as, as it is science. So I think, you know, if you can demonstrate that you're obvious, if you can, if you can demonstrate that you're not only thorough and you could break down a problem, but you can also see the art of, you know, how this thing, how something could uh, uh, take shape and and somehow communicate that or field an idea or you know uh, source an idea. Yeah, as, as Eric was pointing out. Uh, and I'm sure Jason, you know, uh, through your early experience, just doing 
an entrepreneurial stint yourself. Those kinds of things, I think people see and say, okay, this person has put himself in the shoes of an entrepreneur. This person understands the art and philosophy of, uh, of uh, probability and statistics and in, in sort of weighing outcomes. Those are the things we're looking for. And, you know, net, network, network, network. They uh, hey, always be selling, as they say. <laughs> so just get out there and just be tenacious. And yes, it is hard. It's very hard in this virtual world. No question about it. Yeah, I think practically speaking, and so I think everything Raj says, right, it ultimately, it is a lot of hustle and network. And unfortunately, VCs are weird businesses. They're super small. So even the biggest VCs you've heard of are the most famous, like Sequoia, you know, it's a handful of partners and a handful of staff. They don't have, you know, campus recruiting where they come and interview, you know, 70 students and have a class that comes in. Um, they are all non-standard and small, and that makes life a little bit hard for students that want to be in VC. So having said that, VCs will say, they're, again, they're, we're very coin operated in some ways uh, in that we like deals. And so we're always looking for a good deal. And so the easiest way is, and something that I think Harvard undergrad cap, capital partners is doing a great job. It, it is clear that you're helping to make that process of sorting deals from Harvard uh, and MIT and other communities to us very smooth. And therefore, um, you know, you're getting that experience, you're building that connective tissue. Uh, we're actually, we, we have seven summer interns joining us this summer that are from this program and other programs like it. All of them are part of their school's venture capital club. They all have experience in this world and they're extraordinary. They're extraordinarily talented. And in fact, we only wanted two interns, but there were so many good ones. We said, you know, that we'd be silly not to take more. I just want, I want to add one, one anecdote or story on to Eric's because uh, it has to do with Harvard. About uh, seven years ago, my, my first startup failed and I was sitting in Boston living with my parents and I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do. And I heard about venture capital and I was like, that seems like a great job. And so I literally started driving for Uber at night and I started sourcing deals during the day for venture firms in New York City. And where did I go? I went to Harvard and I started walking around Harvard and I went to the, you know, the, the iLab and I walked around MIT, I went to the 100K competition and I literally just busted my butt, went all around Boston all the time and basically just kept saying to founders, like, if you want to raise money in New York, I'm happy to get you in front of the right people. And like, if you can just figure out how to connect the dots and add value, like it'll work itself out. But to Eric's point, it's all about timing and there's not that many opportunities, you know? There are less VCs in the U.S. than there are professional baseball players. So it's all about just persistence and continuing to, you know, really work hard at the end of the day because a lot of people want those jobs. I think the only other thing I'd say, everyone has a slightly different story. So just because it worked for your friend down the hall doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you in the same way. Uh, hustle helps, but very few, uh, very few undergrads make it into the VC industry. So you know, don't necessarily discourage what Eric said about getting, uh, knowing what good looks like, you know, going to work at a really credible uh, large company, just getting the sense of how to evaluate businesses uh, and operate businesses can set you up for that position later in life, even if you don't do it right out of college. Well, thank you all uh, for your great insights. That concludes our panel discussion for today. Um, I will pass it over to uh, the HUCP and HCFF uh, HCCF organizing team for closing remarks. Thank you. Just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers, Eric, Jason, Raj, and Tony for taking the time to join us today. This has been an incredibly insightful conversation. I've learned so much, we've all learned so much. Um, there's a lot of real world advice for founders and students wanting to get into VC. Eric, what you said about what good looks like, the need to find a community, Jason about having sub-theses sub and the growth of the consumer in China, Raj about either failing small or succeeding big, and Tony about seeking customer feedback over product building and found the need for founders with technical expertise. It's all been incredible. So thank you so much. If you'd like to hear more, this panel is just the beginning of a series of awesome events in the week to come. Next week, we have more events from the main HCCF conference featuring topics including healthcare, finance, consumer trends, technology, and more. Hearing from international speakers such as Kevin Rudd, former prime minister of Australia, Tang Jin Yi, China CEO of Credit Suisse, and many others. 
A full conference agenda is online at harvardchina.org. And on the HCCP side, you can hear more great content like this through our YouTube channel, Big Plug, where we've posted our fireside chats and workshops with leading US VCs from our four-day startup bootcamp. We also have an innovation fund competition featuring Harvard's premier startups, which you can learn about on our podcast out on Apple and Spotify. And we really hope to see you at future HCCP programming. So yeah, thank you everybody and have a great rest of your day.